Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to begin talking about sedimentary environments and sedimentary rocks. So to begin with we're going to start by looking at some of the sedimentary environments which occur on land. Now the thing that's so helpful about sedimentary rocks is that they are the only type of rock that really tells us about what was going on on the surface of the earth when the sediment was being formed. So igneous and metamorphic rocks are wonderful if you're typically looking at things that were happening in the subsurface, so things that are happening underground in the Earth's interior. When it comes down to it, only sedimentary rocks can really give you a, a rounded image of what was going on in an area at a certain period of geologic time. Now, the reason we can do this is because each environment in which sediment is being deposited is different. And so this means that each environment is going to have its own different conditions, and this is going to affect the type of sediment which is being deposited in that environment. And of course, that sediment is then going to get turned into sedimentary rocks. So what sedimentary geologists do is we go to modern examples of environments in which sediment is being actively deposited. So think of somewhere like a desert or a floodplain, for instance. And we will look at the sediment that's being deposited in that environment now. So we'll look at things like how big is the sediment? What's the shape of the sediment? You know, are there any distinct structures that we can find in the sediment? Like are the layers of sediment very, very thin or are they big, thick layers? Or are there indications of there having been ripples in the sediment? Those kinds of things will be looked for by sedimentary geologists in modern environments. And we will come up with a list of criteria for individual environments of deposition. So once we know the types of sediments that we expect to find in those environments, we can then go to the rock record, we can look at the sedimentary rocks that we have, and we can apply those criteria to the sedimentary rocks. And essentially that allows us to work out, right, this sedimentary rock formed in a desert, or this sedimentary rock formed in a meandering river system. And so this means that by doing this, we can essentially work out what was the environment when that sediment was being deposited. And so if we do that for the same area over a long period of geologic time, we can see how that environment has been changing throughout Earth history. So sedimentary rocks are extremely important to geologists for this reason. So if we look at the diagram that we have here, you can see that we have an image of the surface of the Earth. And we're going to list some of the environments of deposition which are present on the, on the continents, not all of them, just the main ones. So the types of environments that we're looking at are areas which are mountainous. We'll be thinking about areas which are affected by glaciers. We are looking at areas which will be affected by uh, streeps, uh, steep streams or rivers. So that's essentially rivers which are going down um, topography that has quite a steep gradient. We're going to be dealing with sand dunes. So that's obviously going to be a desert environment. We're going to think about gentle meandering rivers. We're going to think about deltas and we're going to think about lakes. So the first thing you'll notice is that the sediment that's being transported is being moved around by various mediums. So in the case of a glacier, the sediment is obviously being moved by the ice. In the case of the desert, the sediment is being moved by the wind. In the case of mountainous terrains where there's landslides, the sediment is being primarily moved due to gravity. And then, of course, you can see we also have sediment which is being moved due to the movement of liquid water. So you can see there are four mediums that can move the sediment around. So one more time, that's water, ice, wind, gravity. And of course, we also know that these uh, individual mediums are going to be operating at different intensities in different environments. So, for instance, we know that a river which exists in steep mountainous terrain is going to be dropping very, very quickly because the gradient is going to be quite steep. And this means the water is going to be moving quite fast. And so it's going to have quite a lot of energy. So that obviously means that the water in those environments has the capacity to move larger material because the water is so energetic. In contrast, our lake, well, that also consists of liquid water. However, that liquid water in the middle of our lake is near stationary. It's barely moving at all. 
And so this means that because that particular environment and the water there has such a low energy, it means it can only move very, very fine material. So you're not going to get the big rocks that you would get in, for instance, a river system associated with a steep gradient. So you can see how the environment is going to have a direct effect on the sediment being deposited and therefore the sedimentary rock that forms. So let's begin by looking at the first four environments. Let's think about mountainous terrain. Well, in mountainous terrain, we tend to get sediments which are being uh, deposited due to landslides or fast flowing water. So, you know, associated with quite steep uh, rivers. So sediments related to landslides are typically going to consist of a broad range of pieces of rock. And you can see them all here. So there's our sediment right there. And these sediments are often going to be quite angular. And you can see how these pieces of rock right here have lots and lots of sharp corners. So this is going to be the kind of material we would expect to get in mountainous terrain. This is the kind of material that we would expect to find associated with landslides. Now, in terms of glaciers, a glacier is like a giant bulldozer. And so this means that our glacier is going to move a range of different sizes of sediment, everything from really, really, really fine mud all the way up to giant boulders, which can be the size of four bedroomed houses. So, you know, there's quite a big range of sediment size associated with sediments deposited by glaciers. And you can see some of it here along the side. You can see this is a mixture of very fine, dusty looking material and also larger chunks of rock. So we would expect to see that within the sediment that's being deposited. Now, because the sediment is being transported, though, that's also going to affect the shape of the sediment. So if we look at our mountainous terrain here, we can, we can see that this sediment has probably come from rock falling off this cliff here. It's therefore only being transported for, let's say, a few hundred metres, so not very far at all. In contrast, sediment that's moved by a glacier is going to be transported over large distances, sometimes kilometres, tens of kilometres, maybe even hundreds of kilometres. And so this means that your pieces of rock are going to have time to be degraded by the transportation process. They're going to get rounder. And so we're going to get in our glacial sediment, we're going to get a sediment that's quite poorly sorted. So we're going to have a big range of rock sizes in the sediment. But the pieces of rock that we have will typically be relatively round. In contrast, the sediment we're getting from our mountainous terrain is going to be quite angular but it is going to be quite poorly sorted, so we're going to have a, a big range of, of, of sizes when it comes to the pieces of rock in the sediment. So you can see how we have two different environments, and the different conditions in those environments are going to affect the sediment that we have. In terms of our steep stream, well, obviously we're going to see a sediment that's going to contain reasonably large pieces of rock because our water is dropping quite quickly because it's going down quite a steep gradient. This means it's going to have lots of energy, so it can transport larger pieces of rock. So we would expect to see the types of sediment associated with this type of environment being more gravelly. For instance, we would expect to see lots of gravel, maybe some cobbles, some sand, we won't see super large pieces of rock though, so we won't see really big chunks of rock like we, we would get here and here, because although the water's moving fast, it's not moving that fast. So we're not going to be able to move, you know, stupidly large boulders. But nevertheless, we're going to get quite a coarse sediment associated with our, um, with our steep stream because the water has more energy. And then we have down here, we have our sand dune environment, our desert environment. Well, we know that the wind is on the whole not the strongest transporting medium out there so it can't move big stuff so it can't move boulders it can't move cobbles it can't really move gravel either but it can move sand and so this helps to explain why our desert environment is so sand rich so the bigger pieces of rock you know can't be moved by the wind the smaller stuff, the very, very fine mud sized sediment, well, that gets picked up by the wind and it gets blown out of the area, it gets taken away over huge distances. And so that means the only type of sediment that the wind can move is sand. And so this it helps to explain why these desert environments are so rich in sandy sediments. It's purely a reflection of the transporting medium and the amount of energy that transporting medium has. You'll also notice 
how the movement of the sediment is producing these dunes that we can quite clearly see in the image. The presence of these dunes will be uh, incorporated into the sediment. So the sediment, when it's lithified and turned into a rock, will contain indicators of these dunes having existed. And this is really helpful to geologists because we can look at this and say, right, we've got a sandy sediment, we've got some dunes, that would suggest maybe it's a desert. But the other thing we can do is the, the sedimentary structures left by these dunes can actually give us an idea of which way the sediment was being pushed, which way it was being transported. And this is a great piece of evidence to have, to have as a geologist because you, you know, it gives you some idea of how the environment was operating. You would never get that kind of environment from, let's say, something like a a, you know, a mafic lava flow to a basalt you would never be able to get any kind of information like you know what was the prevailing wind direction you just you know just wouldn't have those kinds of indicators in the rock so sedimentary rocks are extremely powerful and helpful things so next uh, the next environment we're going to think about are gentle meandering rivers now these are essentially uh, bodies of water which are moving over relatively flat terrain and so this means the water is going to be slowing down, so that means it's going to have less energy. So once again, we're not going to see these big pieces of rock uh, that you would get in higher energy environments. Instead, we're going to get lots of sand-sized pieces of rock. We're going to get some finer stuff like muds. And you can actually see in your river right here, you can see you know, the presence of the muds by the fact that the water looks so muddy. So these fine muddy particles are just being suspended in the water and transported along with it. So that helps to explain why the water here looks so cloudy. The heavier material, the sandy material, is going to be at the bottom of the river in what's called the bed load. Now either side of the river though, we have this flat terrain. And this area is flat because the river over time will steadily move laterally across this area. This is the area we refer to as a floodplain. And the movement of this river left and right across the floodplain is going to essentially smooth it off so it becomes a nice flat area. Now the floodplain itself is going to be very rich in muddy sediments. So the reason for that is, is when your river floods, obviously you have water that exits the river and goes over the floodplain. Well we can see straight away in this image this water is full of mud. And so as the water exits the river, it starts to slow down, it loses velocity, the water eventually comes to a standstill so it's barely moving at all and then this decrease in energy then allows this very very fine material to rain out onto our floodplain from the water and this helps to explain why our floodplain is so rich in mud. Now in terms of deltas we have a situation where we have a river hitting a body of water and so this means the the water that's part of our river which does have velocity it's moving so it has energy all of a sudden comes to a stop as soon as it hits this essentially this immovable mass of water which could be a sea an ocean or a lake and so this sudden deceleration of the river means that the sediment that the river is transporting has to be dumped then and there because the water loses velocity and we see this build up of material in the form of a delta so lakes are going to have a, a few different types of environments. The center of your lake is going to consist of very, very still water that's barely moving at all. And so we would expect to see a very, very fine sediment. However, the edges of your lake, well, in, that, in, in this instance, the water here is going to be constantly stirred up by the wind. So we're going to get waves forming. So the waves are going to be hitting the, the beach of our lake and essentially this is going to lead to the formation of things like ripples and once again these ripples can be preserved in the sediment and therefore when that sediment gets lithified and turned into a sedimentary rock we can see the ripples and depending on the types of ripples that we have it can tell us something about the types of environment so you know there isn't just one type of ripple there's actually two one is uh, one is called an asymmetrical ripple and one is called a symmetrical ripple an asymmetrical ripple forms in environments where we have uni directional flow so the transporting medium is just going in one direction so the classic example of that would be a river in contrast symmetrical ripples form in environments where we have bi-directional flow so we have flow in two different directions so think of our lake edge the water the wave is going to be moving up the beach it's going to hit the beach so the water is coming up the beach and then as the water steadily slows down it loses velocity and then it goes back down the beach back into the lake we have sediment being transported up the beach and then being pulled back down the beach. So we have bi-directional flow, flow in two directions. And so this is going to give us symmetrical ripples. 
And so this is one of the things that a geologist can look for. So, for instance, you know, the types of sediment we would get associated with beaches would tend to have a symmetrical ripple because of the effect of the waves. In contrast, any sediment that's being deposited in our river here would have asymmetrical ripples because the water is just flowing in one direction. So you can see how we have these little indicators in the rock which really help geologists. And then the final environment are wetland environments. So these are often very, very low energy environments. So there's going to be lots and lots of muddy material because once again, the lower the energy, the smaller the material that can be moved. So you're not going to get big pieces of rock. You're not going to get lots of boulders or cobbles or gravel. You're not going to get a lot of sand, but what you are going to get is a lot of mud. And this mud is going to be waterlogged. There's going to be lots and lots of moisture in it. And so this means that obviously it's pretty good for plants to grow in. So you're going to you know, have these wetland areas being quite heavily vegetated. But because the sediment itself is so waterlogged, it means that when organic material falls into it, there's a chance it might not decompose. And so this can eventually lead to this undecomposed organic material turning into things such, such as coal, or it could turn into uh, natural gas, for instance. So you can see that each environment has its own distinct set of conditions. This is going to produce a distinctive type of sediment, and therefore we can use this sediment to essentially analyse rocks in the geologic record. All right, thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.